All right, the part of the passage I'm going to be preaching from here in Matthew chapter 28, of course, is known as the Great Commission. We're going to start rereading here the last three verses. Verse number 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And this is a passage that is very famous, very popular. As I was saying during the announcement time, you know, this is what our church is all about. This is that great commission that Jesus Christ is sending forth after his resurrection. He said, okay, here's your job. This is what I want you to do now. I want you to go into all the world. It says in Mark, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Here he's saying, go ye therefore and teach all nations. So this isn't just for your local areas. This isn't just, you know, this is, he's saying, you need to go and spread the word far and wide. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He says, teach all nations, baptizing them. So how, why are we baptizing them? Because they're getting saved, right? He's not saying to baptize them just for baptizing them. Baptize them because you're leading them to Christ. Baptize them after they get saved and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So part of the Great Commission, it's not just leading people to Christ. It's leading people to Christ. It's baptism, and it's teaching all things. It's teaching everything that Christ commanded, everything in God's Word. People need to be discipled and taught and brought up. And we want to try our best to fulfill this Great Commission. This is what it's all about. This is what the Christian life is all about reaching other people with the gospel. Now, I'm going to be teaching on just one particular aspect of this and one subject because it's come up a few times in church and, and I, I had thought that I had taught or preached on this before or men, maybe I mentioned it in passing, but I kind of want to give a, um, a very thorough explanation of what I'd like you to do for everyone who goes out and wins souls of Christ. What I'd like you to do as far as follow-up is concerned and what I believe about following up with people. Um, because there's different opinions out there. People have different ideas of what you, know, what you should do, what we shouldn't do. And I'm going to try to get into all of that. And we're starting, first of all, just from Scripture. And then we'll get into a little bit more of the practical, what I'd like to see happening here at our church. Um, first of all, though, it's very clear from this passage that it's not just about winning souls. We're, we're supposed to be teaching and and you know, getting people baptized and things like that. There's the, the whole gamut, the whole run of uh, spiritual life, a spiritual reproduction is what you're doing. When you're winning a soul to Christ, you want that, that person, once they're saved, they're born again, right? They're, they're a babe in Christ. They're a brand new believer. When, when someone decides for the very first time to put all of their faith, put all of their confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a new birth there. And from that new birth, there's a lot of growth that they need to do, just like any birth, it's just like a physical birth. When a child's born into this world, they need to grow, right? We want, and and as, a, as a, a parent especially, you want that child to grow up and to be nurtured and, and to be guided into the right ways and to be taught and to be instructed. Well, I believe that we ought to deal with spiritual children in a similar fashion. Now, there's a big difference between the physical child and the spiritual child, right? The physical child, they need somebody to, to uh, care for them, and if they don't have someone to care for them, they're going to die, right? The physical life, it's only good. There's, there's a physical death that comes after that. The good thing about a spiritual life is that once someone's spiritually alive, they're never going to die. That's eternal life. That's everlasting life. So anybody who puts their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, if they don't get the nurture, if they don't get the nourishment, if they don't get somebody helping them and looking out for them, you know what? They're still alive. They're not going to die. So we put the importance on and the focus on winning people to Christ more than we do the follow up and follow through and trying to make sure everyone's getting the nourishment that they want and they need. Because... At the end of the day, let's face it, some people, they don't want 
to have somebody guiding them. They don't want to have the instruction. They just don't. They feel like maybe they don't need it or whatever the case may be. And because they've already had their physical birth and they may be an adult, they may be a grown person. Hey, they can make their choice for themselves on how their spiritual life is going to continue. So bearing that in mind, that's why you can't just take one example and just apply it blankly without, without providing a little bit more insight, which is pretty common sense, but it needs to be mentioned. You can't just, just make a phrase and just run with it. I've heard people say, oh man, yo, you're, just, you're just creating all these spiritual babies and just leaving them to die on the doorstep. Well, no, we're not leaving them to die because they have eternal life. They're not going to die ever again. And I've, I've actually heard people criticize um, soul winning efforts where you go, we used to do, at, when I was going to Faith Forward Baptist Church in Arizona, we would do these small town soul winning events and we'd go to remote places in Arizona and just preach the gospel. Places that nobody's out there knocking doors, nobody's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we would go out there as a church and say, hey, we're going to take a day or two days or three days, however long it takes to get through this town and we're going to knock every door and we're going to try to preach the gospel to everybody in that town. That sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Amen, right? Try to lead someone who's lost to the Lord. Great thing. But you know what the naysayers say? Oh, but what, what are you doing? With, are you going back? Are you following up with them? Are you, you know, are you, what about church? Are you just leaving them th there on the doorstep? Well, look, it's way better. It's way better that a person gets saved from going to hell and spending an eternity burning and being tortured and tormented and actually going to heaven when they die. That's way better than having to make sure, oh, they're getting in church and they're growing and everything else. You can get somebody in church and you can spend all kinds of time with them and you can get them to clean up their life, but if they're not saved, they're still going to hell. Amen. The important thing, the most important thing is that they put their trust in Jesus Christ. And that's what we focus on by far and away the most. And that's what I teach and that's what I believe. And I think that we should put the, the vast majority of our resources and our time into reaching more people with the gospel of Christ. But that being said, there is a place for following up with the people and trying to get them discipled and trying to get them in church and trying to help them to improve. But the biggest obstacle that we face with that is when people simply don't want it. Now, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been going soul winning since 2006. So for the past 13 years, I've been faithfully going out soul winning pretty much on a weekly basis, if not multiple times a week. So I've seen a lot of, and I'm not saying this to brag, I'm just saying that you know, after, after a long time, you start getting a lot of experience. And I've tried a lot of different things because, hey, it's important. The whole purpose that we go out and preach the gospel to people is because we care for them. Right? That's, at least that's one reason. That's one of the main reasons. We love people. We don't want them to go to hell. We love God. We want to keep his commandments. We want to do what he's told us to do. He's instructed us to go and do this. So, hey, let's go and, and reach people. Let's show them how to be saved. And when you go and you, and you try to show people the gospel, you love that person. You don't want them just to, to you know, after they get saved, to just live a, a useless life, live a life where it doesn't really accomplish anything at all, where they don't end up growing and going to church and things like that. You want them to succeed. You want them to be the best child of God that they can be. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of things that we can do where we'll end up wasting our time too. And our time is limited. Our time is precious. So we want to be wise with our methodology, with the way that we do things. And what I'm teaching today we're going to be using scripture as our foundation for principles, for principles. This isn't an area that is spelled out to a T of, you know, how you organize your life and, and exactly how much time you spend doing this and doing that and, and what is the right amount of follow up and what is it, you know, this is going to be more interpreted based on principles of what we should be doing. So if you disagree with, with some of the things I'm going to say, I don't have a problem with that. You know, I mean, it's not some big deal to, you know, well, I, I think we should be doing this much time instead of that much time. Okay. 
Just try to, <laughs> try, to, try to stick with some of the wisdom that I'm trying to impart here on one, the method that we're going to use here as a church, the one that, that as the leader that, that, that I want to see our soul winners doing, and then just the reasoning behind it. So yeah, you can adapt it. You can modify it to your own schedule, to your own amount of time you have. Because what we don't want to have happening, and what's happened, unfortunately, in many churches is all of soul winning has become follow-up. Many churches have replaced going out and knocking on doors and preaching the gospel just to, to random people, to strangers, to people you don't even know, with visitation of people who just come and visit church for the first time. And then they go and they'll bring up the gospel or whatever. But it's like those are the only people that they target and they just end up spending a whole bunch of time talking to those people more interested in trying to get them to come to church than they are with making sure that their soul is saved and they're going to heaven. Now, I'm not against people coming to church. I would love to have more people come to church. I think that's great. But one, we don't gear our church services for the unsaved. We, teach, we gear them for the saved. One thing you'll notice if you stay through for the whole service, we also don't do any altar calls. And the reason for that is because our church service is geared for people who are already saved. It's not geared for people who are not saved. But here's the thing. Are there going to be people who are unsaved that come into our church services? Absolutely. It's going to happen. And, and is that wrong? Is that bad? No, of course not. But that's why our model and our plan here is that instead of making people, and we were just talking about this last week, right? Imagine going into a church. You've never been, maybe you've never been to church or you've never been to this church before or that church and you don't really know anybody there or maybe you know one person. You're already kind of uncomfortable. You're not saved, but you, you, maybe you want to know Christ. You, you want to get saved. You just don't know how. And you come into church and the only offer that they're offering is, well, hey, come on down the aisle. You sit all the way in the back because you're kind of shy. Maybe you're a little embarrassed. You, you, don't, you don't know anyone. You feel uncomfortable. You're sitting all the way in the back of the church and they're saying, well, come on up here and we'll tell you how you get saved and come up in front of everybody and kneel down and we'll have someone come and talk. You know, not everyone's going to do that. Yeah, that's right. Right. Now, everyone who's ever been saved that way, praise God that, some, that, that you got saved. But I don't think that that's the best way of, of preaching the gospel to people. Our model here is for people within the church, when, and, and for any visitors today, don't be offended if someone approaches you after church because this is the way that we do things here. We like to ensure that everyone who walks through these doors knows 100% for certain that they're saved. So the way that we do that and the way that I teach that things should be done here is that as you welcome and greet guests, because we ought to be doing that anyways, being friendly, nice, hospitable, we also ask, well, hey, can I ask you a question, please? Do you know for sure if you were to die today, you'd be going to heaven? Why? Because we care about you. We care about our visitors. We want to know that you know for sure you're going to heaven. And there's a lot of different beliefs out there, and there's a lot of false doctrines, and there's a lot of people who are trusting in works, and there's a lot of people who are trusting in baptism, there's a lot of people who are trusting in other things other than just Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. So that's why we talked to people. And you know what? That's a lot more of a comfortable setting, speaking one-on-one -on -one with someone, not being the center of attention, not having all eyes on you, but everyone's kind of mingling around or whatever. Then you can have a personal conversation with somebody and not expect them to walk up in front of everybody else in order to make that decision to, to get saved that day. Look, you can make a decision anywhere you are and we want to try to make it as easy as, uh, as easy as possible for people to make that decision, not as hard as possible. Right. You don't have to prove anything to anyone in order to get saved. Right. That's between you and God. That has to do with your heart. You have to prove that you're willing to walk in front of everybody and, and lay down your life. Look, no one's asking you to be Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Right. Yeah. You don't have to carry that cross in order to be saved. Jesus did that for you already. Yeah. Let's not lay extra burden on top of people in order for them to get saved. Let's do our best to make it as simple as possible. And that's why we do that here. So um, what does that have to do with follow-up? I don't know. But I got, I got off on that a little bit. Let's turn to Luke chapter 14. We want to go to some more things. But um, 
just explaining how we, how we do things here. How do we operate? We don't gear our church service for, for unsaved people. We gear, it, we gear it for people who are saved. We want, we want people to grow and learn. That's why we don't preach the gospel every week from the pulpit. Because if you're here and you're saved, you already know the gospel. Now, we teach on different doctrines, different things that have to do with the gospel. We'll teach on various subjects to help you to, to, to know them and, and be cemented in them and to, and to be able to turn to scriptures and prove what you believe and things like that. But um, we want you to grow. And that's what church is. And ultimately, what church is, church is the disciple, the discipling program that we have. It's church. So one of the methods out there, and I'm going to be jumping around. It, it doesn't matter what order my notes are in because um, I want to cover this now. Oftentimes, people see, you're going to find the most complaints about how much follow-up you do. Usually it's from people who do zero soul winning, who don't go out and preach the gospel, but they want to tell you what's the best way to do something that they don't even do. And I'll tell you right, right out of hand, if, if you never go and, and actually open up your mouth and preach the gospel to anyone ever, I don't want to hear what you have to say on how to do it. I have, I have zero interest in hearing how to do something that you've never done before and you don't know how to do. Don't tell me how to do it. Just as much as I'm not going to go and tell, you know, a physician or a surgeon how to operate on a heart or operate on a brain. I've never done it before. I might even be able to read about it, but I've never done it before. There's, there's something that goes a long way with experience. There's people that, that think they know everything just from reading. No, you actually have to do But that's where you're going to find most of the, the naysayers from. But what they kind of often will have in their mind is, well, you need to go to their house and do whatever it is that you have to do in order to bring them up and to rear them and to teach them. Well, I'm okay with spending some time following up with people, and, and that's what I'm going to get to. We're going to encourage that. But the goal is to bring them to the discipling sessions. See, here's the way it works. Let's say... I wanted to, which I do, I'd like to teach and instruct everyone that's here today. Well, how much time do you think I have? If I was an individual, I'd say, okay, what's your schedule? What time are you free? Do you have time at this time? Okay, we'll spend an hour together there. And then, okay, next person. Let, now, when are you free? When's your schedule clear? When can we go, you know? And if I have to schedule this with everybody, and if we're doing a lot of soul winning, here's the thing, if you're doing a lot of soul winning and, and, you're, and you're leading people to Christ, this is what you'd have to do. So keep this in mind on how much time you even have to invest to spend with people to try to teach them and disciple them. That's why we have the discipling sessions here. Because pretty soon it's just going to get out of control. You can't do these home Bible studies with people like the Jehovah's Witnesses want to do. It turn, it'll just turn into being that's all you ever do and then you're not going out and reaching more people. At the end of the day, we have to leave some type of personal responsibility on the people who already have decided to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And we tell them, hey, we've got church. We've got this going on. Please come here. You're going to learn a lot. You'll be able to grow. There's, you know, I think you'll like it, whatever. You give all the reasons why someone should come to church. But at some point, you have to leave it on them to actually come. And like I said before, you care about the people. So you don't want to just you know, feel like you just walk away and have nothing to do with them ever again. It's a good idea to follow up. It's a good idea to, to reconnect. But how we reconnect and the way that we do that, we don't want to end up wasting too much time. Because unfortunately, by and large, what we'll end up seeing is that uh, a lot of people just simply don't want to come to church. And as long as I'm going to say, you're in Luke 14, just flip over Luke 17. We'll go back to Luke 14 in a minute. In Luke 17, because another thing that the scoffers will say is they'll, they'll look at like our bulletin. And we went over this this morning. 
and they'll see numbers in here. And yet we, we like keeping numbers. I think numbers are a great thing. Every number on here, when you look at the salvations and baptisms, the, the records that we keep, they represent souls. They're people. It's not just some number. We're not just trying to, to you know, have a big number just for the sake of having a big number. Every number is a person, an individual that somebody has spent their time you know, walking through the plan of salvation with that person and, and convincing them and persuading them to put their trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what each number represents. And what this does is it helps us to keep a finger on things and to make goals and to say, hey, you know, maybe we need to spend more time out reach, you know, preaching the gospel. We need to re, you know, spend more time trying to reach people and to help us not get lazy. So we see these numbers and it's also encouraging. Hey, praise God, there's other people out here doing this too. You don't have to feel alone in going out and preaching the gospel to people. You've got a whole church full of people that love doing this. And I'll tell you what, the reason why you see numbers like this, we don't have the biggest church in the world. We have a, you know, a relatively small church. But when you see, wow, how did you lead over 200 people to Christ just in the first three months of the year? How did that happen? Do you know why that happened? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of people. It is a lot of people. Do you know how that happens? It's because almost every single person in this church goes out and tries to lead people to Christ. I mean, literally almost every single person in this church does it. When you have that many people doing the work, that number of hours on the street, because it's, it's not like people are just getting saved left and right when you go out sowing. It's a lot of work to it. I found a pretty good average. If you spend an hour of time trying to talk to people, knock on doors, a pretty decent average is about one person's going to get saved per hour. But that's not always the way it works out. Sometimes you can spend three hours and zero people get saved. And you're talking to people and you're trying to convince them and they won't have it. But then other days you can go out and you talk to a few people and they'll get saved. You know, it's just, the bottom line is you need a lot of time. So that's over 200 hours, man hours being put in. That's a lot of time and effort being put into trying to lead people across. And that's how you get those type of numbers. And just for, again, to, for the, especially for people who haven't been here before, we do not believe in this one, two, three, repeat after me type of salvation process where you just say, okay, hey, do you know what Jesus died for your sins? Okay, you know you're a sinner, right? Okay, well, let's just uh, pray with me now and, and, and receive Christ and you'll be saved forever. There are people out there that do that and they bring a bad name on soul winning because they try to rush through the gospel too quick. They don't even use Bible verses half the time. And they just, they just try to get, because, why? Because they just want to impress people or get their numbers up or whatever. Or they're just ignorant and they don't really know what they're doing, one or the other. We take time. I would say the average, at least, at least 10 to 20 minutes we're, we're going through showing verses, explaining, making sure people understand, you know, the ramifications of sin, showing them hell, showing them God's point, you know, showing them what Christ did, showing all of these different things, explaining eternal security, explaining the freeness of the gift, explaining it's by grace, explaining all these different concepts. It's a must. And that's what we practice here. And that's what we teach and believe here as well. It's not just some light thing. And, you know, we communicate with people. Have them ask questions. Ask them questions. Make sure they understand and that we're not just preaching at them and then, okay, let's pray. No. It's a communication. We're, we're, we're interested in their souls. Now, another thing that people will do, and this is what I was trying to get to, they'll look at the numbers and say, oh, well, if this many people got saved, then where are they? How come you don't have an extra 200 people in your church, Pastor Burzens? I mean, did these people really get saved? Where are they? And this is an important concept to understand. Is that just because someone gets saved? Because being saved is easy. Getting saved, it's a free gift. How easy is it just as when someone comes up to you and says, Hey, I'd like you to have this gift. This is a free gift for you. I want you to have it. How easy is it for that person to say, Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll take that. Thanks. That's what salvation is. Salvation is as easy as receiving a free gift. Yeah, that's right. But taking time out of your schedule, deciding to wake up, deciding to go somewhere, deciding to say, hey, I'm going to go to church instead of watching sports, instead of 
doing, you know, doing whatever other activity you might have been used to doing on a Sunday because maybe you haven't been going to church at all anyways. And changing your schedule to do something, you know what, that's a little bit harder. That takes a little bit more character. Jesus illustrates this example perfectly with the lepers that are cleansed in Luke chapter 17. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. So these people were lepers. They were diseased. There was 10 of them. They were sick. They had this leprosy. And Jesus healed them. Completely healed. Restored. Back to full health. 10 of them. Now, look what it says in verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. <coughs> This is a great example of how humans work. What you don't want to get deceived by is by the people who want to say, oh, well, those other nine must not have ever been cleansed then. They actually weren't healed because if they were healed, then they'd come back and they'd thank Jesus Christ. Then they'd show you that they were healed by coming back and returning to give thanks unto Jesus Christ. No, he cleansed 10 of them. Now you say, hey, where's the other nine? Now, should all ten go and thank Christ and go give him thanks? And it, Of course they should. That's the right thing to do when someone does something nice for you, when someone gives you a free gift, when someone heals you. Yeah, the right thing is to give them thanks, to show them respect. Only one person did that, though. When we lead people to Christ... Show them how to be saved. Show them the gospel. Show them the plan of salvation. Explain, hey, this is a free gift. All you got to do is receive this gift by putting your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior. He'll forgive you of all of your sins. All of your sins forgiven. There are many people that are cleansed, that are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ because they accept the free gift that don't then turn around and go to church and give thanks unto God and say, hey, Thank you for all this. There's a lot of people that don't do that. This is why you don't see more people in church end up getting saved. You know who's a good example of this? I'm a perfect example of this. I know firsthand what that's like. You say, but you're pastoring a church. Yeah, I am now. I got saved when I was 20 years old. You know how I got saved? By putting my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you get saved? <laughs> I hope you don't have a different answer than me. Because that's how I got saved. And you know what? That was exciting. And I was, I was thankful when I got saved. I was, I was excited. I was, I was happy. But you know what I didn't do? I never really got plugged into a church. And you know what happened? I still have the same flesh. My flesh hasn't changed. You know what? My flesh still hasn't changed. I have a flesh that wants me to sin. Yeah, yeah. Now, the difference is that I also have a spirit that wants me to do good, but I have a flesh that wants me to sin. And for a long portion of my life when I was younger, when I was a babe in Christ, my spirit wasn't that strong. My spirit has grown. My spirit has gotten a lot more strengthened and nourished over the years to the point to where uh, God has allowed me to be able to take on a position of leadership and be able to teach others. Amen. But the flesh is still here. Always got to watch out for that. And back then, my flesh was way stronger than it is right now. And I decided to walk in the flesh for many years. Does that mean I wasn't saved? Does that mean I didn't receive a free gift? Does that mean I wasn't cleansed? Of course not. No, I was one of the nine Amen. that didn't return and give my thanks. 
But later on, I ended up getting right and, and, and obviously things changed from there. When we lead people to Christ at the door, you don't know what their life, what, what road, what path they're going to take. You could try to offer some assistance, but you may just get rejected. You may just, they might not end up being that interested. Their flesh might still want them to do other things that they've already been doing and that they're used to. And you can't force people to do stuff. <laughs> and that's not what our goal is, that's what we're trying to do. Give people options. Make the, the choices on them. God gave us free will. God gives us the ability to choose. Want to help people and, and, and make it easy for them, but at, this, at the end of the day, the choice is on them. And because there is this pattern within people where 9 out of 10 are going to refuse, that's, that's pretty common. This is, this is a great example of, of and, and it might even be a less number than one out of 10 that actually returned. If he cleansed 100, there might still only be one that returns. I don't know. You know I'm not trying to add anything to what they're saying. I'm just, just based on some other experiences that I've had in general of dealing with people, there's a lot of people that really, they may not return for that. So given this, given the light of this information, this knowledge and experience, this is why we don't spend too much time with the new convert. But we should be spending some. Now, one more point I want to make. You're in Luke 17. Flip back to uh, Luke chapter 14. Actually, no, I'm going to skip this point altogether. Go to, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The sermon has moved on from this point. It's no longer taking the direction that I was thinking when I originally was planning for this, so that's fine. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I made the point without actually turning to the scripture. Basically, Luke 14 explains there's a big difference between being a disciple and being a believer. And I kind of made that point already. Getting saved is easy. But being a disciple, picking up your cross, following Christ, that's hard. That's where the work comes in. Yeah, that's right. And we want to gain disciples. But because it's hard, because it's harder, because that actually requires work. Right. Salvation doesn't require any work. That's free. Being a disciple, being a follower, doing the actual work, that does require work. So as a result, there's going to be less people that are going to choose to take on that task, to choose to become a disciple. I'll just read for you what I was going to, well, I was going to go through and read, but Jesus Christ himself said in Luke 14, verse 26, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Not everybody's willing to do that. And that's being a disciple. That's not being saved. Two different things. Being a disciple as a follower is actually doing work. Being saved has nothing to do with works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Two di let's not confuse the two ever. Two different things. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse number 14. This is the attitude that the Apostle Paul had for the believers, for believers that he led to Christ. And all believers, I believe, you know, everybody. But 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, the Bible reads, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. He's, he's speaking to the church at Corinth and saying, hey, you know, I'm not coming for yours, meaning like your goods, your stuff or anything like that. I'm coming for you because I care about you because the person's important to him. And he's like, you know, hey, I am going to, the, the, the children ought not to lay up for the parents. This is referring to, you know, even just physically in this world, but the parents for the children. Parents pass inheritance down to, to children, right? Our goal as parents, you want to do as much as you can to help your children and give them the best opportunity so as they're growing up, they can, you know, to further, to better, to continue that. 
and not rely on just, well, I'm going to just spend everything I have and then, and then make my children take care of me. Now, obviously, from a, from a parent's perspective and child perspective, the way that the Bible teaches, you should be looking at taking care of each other. So children ought to be burdened with or know, you know, honor thy father and thy mother and take care of them and, and care for them when they get older and, and everything else. And from, that's from the child perspective. And from the parent perspective, it's, hey, I'm going to lay up for my child. I'm going to give them an inheritance. I'm going to sacrifice so that I could give them more. It's a great system that God, God lays out there. And this is the way that Paul is speaking to his spiritual children. He's saying, hey, I, you know, I don't want you to get for me. He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay up for you. The parents are going to lay up for the children. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to bless you and help you. And he says, and I will very gladly spend and be spent. I'll give it all up. I want to help you. He says, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Going back again to, to an unfortunate attitude that a lot of people have. You can invest a lot of time into people and a lot of love and energy in trying to help somebody to grow. And unfortunately, sometimes people still just treat it like it's nothing. Have no respect. Disregard. Have an have a unthankful, ungrateful type of an attitude. Many people have that. It's in Scripture. People had the same attitude towards Jesus. He cleansed lepers of their leprosy. And they still had an ungrateful attitude. If my children are ungrateful to me, that doesn't mean they're not my children. It just means they're being bad kid children. <laughs> right? Just like the lepers are cleansed. It doesn't mean they weren't cleansed. But that wasn't right. We love people. We want them to grow. We want to help them to get, to get plugged in. So this attitude that the Apostle Paul had towards his, his converts, we ought to have that, that, that attitude too. But we're going to do it wisely. So let's get into some of the practicality of what I'm going to be asking you to do if you haven't been doing things like this already. Because, and changing habits can be hard too, and I understand that. And, and I've had a hard time changing my habits when I've realized, hey, there's something more I can do, there's something better I can do, there's a better use of my time, or something that I haven't been doing that I should be doing. Um, and you could come up with your own system. I'm going to end up printing some information on cards. But here's what I found to be the most effective use of time when it comes to following up with people. And it's very, very simple. It's very simple. I'm not asking very much of you. But one thing that you can do, and again, everyone's going to be different. We'll get into that in just a minute. But it, when I end up leading someone to the Lord and leading them to Christ, and we pray and they, and, and, and they get saved, what I'll try to do is ask them, well, hey, do you think you'd like to come to church? Ask them that first. Do you, do you think you'd like to come and attend our church? And, uh, and uh, sometimes I'll throw, hey, I, we could pick you up if you need a ride. We'd love to have you come. Is that something you'd be interested in? If they say no, guess what? I'm not going to follow up with them. If they're not even interested at that point in coming to our church, what am I going to do? Badger them and, and just harass them? That's not going to help anything at all. So if they're still not, if they're not interested in coming to our church, fine. Now, most people won't say no. I mean, you've just had this conversation with them. They're friendly. It's not like they're, they don't want you there or something. They, you've, you've gone through places. Most people will say yes. So I say, okay, well, if you're interested in coming to church, would it be okay if I get your phone number so I could just follow up with you and, you know, remind you about church or whatever? And you could say, you know, something along those lines. Now, at that point, it's becoming a little bit more real of someone actually showing. Because many people just be polite and say, oh, yeah, yeah. And they have no intention of actually going to church. And you know what? That's fine. If that's what they want to do, whatever, Right? But if they give you their phone number, now making a phone call is very easy. And see, one of the things I used to do in the past was I'd actually go and stop by and like show up to people's houses and follow up with them in person. Because, you know, part of the thing is like, well, it's better to, to actually talk to someone in person, face to face. And yeah, there is, but you only have so much time. 
So I limit that. I, I'll still do that occasionally, but the only time that I really do that is if I'm already soloing and I know I'm going to be soloing in the same area and I know I'm going to the same neighborhood and I know like it's going to be very convenient to do, then maybe I'll do that. But the, 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 the most efficient way is to get the phone number because then you'll be able to find out making a phone call doesn't take much time. You can take five minutes out of your week at some point to make a phone call and say, Hey, so and so, I was just thinking about you and, and just wondering, hey, do you plan on coming to church on Sunday or what? You know, talk to them a little bit. Obviously, don't just, uh, we're, we're not, it's, and how to express this, we're not selling anything. Yeah. Right? This isn't a sales call. I'm explaining things in a way where I'm trying to be efficient and make use of your time and stuff like that. So it sounds very business oriented. And leading people to Christ, and other people, you could look at it in a way from a business standpoint, but they're people. I mean, we, we care about somebody. So try not to take this too technically, right? I'm a very technical person, so I, try, I tend to explain things. Technical, okay, we have this much time. Let's, let's be a vision. Let's, you know, we got five minutes. And you, but, <laughs> but they're people, right? <laughs> we want to talk to people and, and, and just, and, hey, how are things going, right? Um, do you have a good week? Just call them. Just, you said you might be interested in coming to church. We've got church at 1030. You think you might come, you know, whatever. I'll take you out to lunch or whatever. Right? I'm not saying you have to buy people stuff, but just try to just be friendly and nice. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll look out for you and give the call. Now, they may not come to church. Or they might say, well, I'm kind of busy that day. I would say this. Take the time to follow up with someone a few times. Two, three times. Give them the phone call. If they just end up flaking you off, blowing off, and, and not showing up and stuff, I would say then it's time to move on. Because, again, you don't want to get to this point of, of you're continually starting to spend more and more and more time with someone who's just not very responsive. At the end of the day, there has to be some responsibility on the person to want to come and to want to be discipled and to be willing with it. Now, the reason why we do this at all, though, is because there are some people that they just need a little bit extra encouragement, just a little bit of extra attention to kind of help get pushed in the right direction. Right. And that's great. And those are the types of people that we're looking to try to reach. Uh, we have someone that comes to our church on a regular basis now that, that was a result of our soul winning. And he's not here this morning, but you know, if it wasn't for um, the follow-up that was done with him, he wouldn't be part of our church. He, we would just probably keep on doing whatever and not coming. But because a church member decided to invest a little bit of time in making some calls and kind of just seeing how things are going and, and saying, hey, we'll pick you up and, and we'll bring you to church and putting forth that extra effort, there's someone who's made a lot of change in his life now yeah, and, and, and is growing and has grown spiritually quite a bit as a result of being discipled. So, um, at the end of the, I brought this up before, when you, when you get to the end, because we're almost done here. When you lead someone to Christ, ask to get their name and their phone number. <coughs> Write it down. I don't care how you do it. I've got index cards. I put index cards out on, in the foyer. For you to take with you, there should be pens out there as well. Grab a pen, grab an index card. Um, I'll get a little pre-printed form ready for you on these uh, eventually, but it's not rocket science, so you don't, you don't have to worry about filling in every last little thing. But some little bits of information would be good for you and helpful would be the date. So if you're keeping your own records, you know how long it's been since you talked to a person or whatever. Um, I recommend trying to contact them at least twice. Try to keep a little... And, and you know what? You gauge it from there. If people are seem really interested and you're getting some good feedback, good response, or they end up showing the church and then they don't come to church for a while, you know, keep the communication open with those people. But if, if someone says, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll come. Oh, wait, no. You know, and then they just don't show up. And you, oh, yeah, 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 I want to come. And then they don't show up. You can kind of get a feel for whether or not they're just telling you what you want to hear versus being sincere. Right. Or, and some people are just like, you know what, yeah, no, I'm not really interested. At that point, fine. 
We're not, gonna, we're, we're not in the business of harassing people at all. We want people to grow. So some of the things that I make mention of after someone gets saved is, is one, coming to church, explain the importance of coming to church, because too many people today have this, this idea that church really isn't that important. Well, I can have church in my house. I could have church, you know, anytime I talk with my friends about Jesus, that's church. No, it's not church. And there's lots of passages you could show people. You could show them Hebrews 10. You could go to Ephesians chapter 4. You could go to other places and explain that church is important for growth for, and, and for fellowship and for many other reasons. Uh, also, bring up baptism. Because if they just got saved, guess what the first thing they need to do is, or they ought to do is, is get baptized. And that's another good reason to come to church because we'll baptize you. <laughs> you, haven't been, you haven't been baptized. You know, you just got saved. Explain baptism to the person. Explain that, that, you know, maybe you've been baptized in the past. Maybe you're baptized as a baby. Maybe you're baptized in some other church. But if you just got saved today, then you need to get baptized because the other baptism doesn't matter because the baptism that counts is, is the one that happens after a person believes. Um, and again, I'm not going to teach all on baptism, but these are some of the things that I'll bring up with someone who just gets saved. And then the last point that I'll bring up with someone is the, the King James Bible, getting them on the, the right Bible version so that they're, they're getting the Word of God. But the, the baptism and the church thing, you know, bring this stuff up. Don't, you know, if someone puts their faith in Christ, continue as much as you can you know, a little bit at least. To, to, and again, people have various amount of times. I know there's all kinds of different situations. Some people are just running out the door. They're going to work. They barely give you enough time as it is. I get it. And then also, uh, sometimes there's children that get saved and they're not coming to church on their own. So you have to just say, hey, you know, talk to your parents about this. They're a teenager. They're, you know, whatever. And they're not going to be able to make it on their own. Um, have them, you know, talk to their parents or whatever and, and, and do that. So also the one last point, when you get someone saved, when you lead someone to Christ, pray for that person just for a week or two weeks or whatever, right? Just, just take some time out though. When you're doing your regular prayer time, pray for that person. When you, when you pray for people, you'll end up, and, and hopefully you've noticed this with the prayer challenge last month, you end up actually thinking and caring about those people a little bit more. When you're spending time in prayer for someone, it becomes more personal for you because you're taking time out of your day and you're thinking about them and you're praying to God to help that person. You're going to have more love towards the people that you decide to pray for. So even the, the, the person that just got saved that you don't even really know you're going to have a little bit more love for that person if you spend a, even a little bit of time in prayer. Get their name. Write their name down. Not just, oh, that person in apartment 2B. I mean, ask them for their name. Write down their name. And, and you know, if, they're, if, if they'll give you a phone number, get their phone numbers. You call them and, uh, and pray for them care about them. Pray that, that God will stir up their spirit and, and that you can help be a blessing to them and you can help them to be disciple and get them in church. This is what I would like to see from, from our soul winners is just that amount of effort. It doesn't have to be some great amount. Just a little bit, I think, can go a long way. And I'm not expecting to see some huge numbers as a result of, of everyone following this. But you know what? A little bit is going to be great. I mean, praise the Lord for every extra person that can become discipled. And, and it really doesn't amount to a whole lot extra work. Just, just a couple phone calls per, per person. And um, maybe you go out in some other area. Again, if you're in areas, as long as you know of a church that you could send people to, especially if, it's, if you're soul winning out of state, Getting them into any, you know, getting them into any decent church is what they need. So, I mean, anything, that, as long as they've got the right gospel and, and the word of God, I mean, get them into that church. Point people that way. Still follow up. Even if you're doing soul winning at a distance, just find the best church that you could point people to that's, that they're actually have a probability of attending. You know, I don't expect people, new converts that get saved, you know, hours from here to, to make a trek out to our church. And you know what? They don't have to come to our church. 
but they ought to be getting into a decent church and, and growing. Amen. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for saving us. We thank you for the free gift of salvation, Lord. Pray that you would please help us all to um, be wise with our time and to, but to also love people and, and to continue to care for them and, and try to at least get, get them motivated to come to church or to, to get baptized, Lord, and, and to help them along in their spiritual growth. And especially people that, that do show up and, and do come to church to be able to continue to try to help them to grow and take a personal interest in people. Uh, we see many examples in Scripture of the Apostle Paul referring to people as his spiritual children and um, help us to, to see people that we lead to Christ in a similar fashion where we can uh, care about them as a, as a father does a son, as a mother does a daughter, and, and care for them to help them to grow and to succeed in their spiritual life and walk with you, Lord. Uh, give us the wisdom and, and understanding that we need to be able to teach and to preach and to bring people to Christ, Lord. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.